Thank you, Bryson. Um, I'm really glad to be here today. This has been a fantastic con. Um, gratitude to Leslie um, and, and Ray and everybody else um, on staff and volunteered to put this on. Um, so kind of two goals today. The first of which is to help you avoid my struggle as a baby CISO and efficiently feed your face. Um, I am a first generation knowledge worker, first generation college grad. Um, I have a neck tattoo. I am not a typical person, security leadership by merit of the fact I am not a white man. Um, I've been a security leader since um, August, 2020. I feel like as you can tell from the deck, especially when we get into my food, I'm, I'm a deeply messy person as well. Um, and I am in a wonderful feminist relationship, but my partner on the right, and I have agreed that, that life seems to be a little bit better if I am the individual who has primary responsibility for cooking. Pancakes versus waffles. I like all carbs. I wore carb color today, um, but I'm a big fan of just classic pancakes as well as, as biscuits and gravy. So a little bit about my journey. Um, I became director of security at a startup, cloud native startup um, in August of 2020. Prior to that, I had a background in program management and analytics. Um, so this is kind of coming from the perspective of somebody who has built a security function. I worked really hard for about 19, 20 months in that role, passed three audits, scaled security from series A to C. And in December, I got a new job. Um, in my current role, I am uh, part of a great um, security team of smart people. And I'm doing some research on about 400 million cyber assets at 1,300 organizations. I don't have my boss's permission to drop this, this knowledge yet, but it's relevant to some of what else I'm going to talk about. Um, and you can expect that report, which is going to be called the SCAR, the State of Cyber Assets Report, in late February 2020. Uh, 22. So security leadership is difficult, and I think that it might even be impossible. Um, CISOs are really not a terribly diverse sector um, of the market. They are 95% white, 85% male. Um, Gartner research shows that the majority of CISOs really struggle and do not have fantastic results. Um, there's additional research to show that the average CISO lasts 11 months in a job before quitting. Um, the current research I'm working on um, sh has showed me that the average organization has over 200,000 alerts in their backlog, and that can be alerts from um, cloud security posture management tools like GuardDuty, and it can also be vulnerability scanner findings. Um, and it's, it's really pretty overwhelming, especially when you consider the fact that um, there is about one security person for every 200 um, employees. But something I have observed is the fact that we are here because of a deep commitment. Um, pretty much everybody in security really cares about security. This comic is about sysadmins, but it feels incredibly personal. The idea of climbing up ventilation ducts and walking across broken glass during a hostage situation to um, kind of restore availability, it, it feels deeply personal. <laughs> when I speak to people who are you know, more experienced than me, I always ask them what gives them hope for the future of security. And I can say from my personal experience that the people around me, my community, are what gives me hope. Um, I believe that we can change and we are creating change. Um, over the last 15 years, security has gone from the basement to the boardroom. Um, the CISO's role in a business is, is more important than ever. It used to be that security was this weird niche hobby shop of IT um, in the basement. And now we're on customer calls, we're customer facing, which is something that, that Emily Gladstone Cole referenced quite a bit in her talk. Um, customers care about security, so they want to talk to the CISO. Um, I think it's arguable that businesses are increasingly competing on confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and CISOs are crucial business enablers. And something else um, that gives me a lot of hope is the fact that large organizations are shifting to an office of the CISO structure where there is multiple CISOs, multiple specialists, um, because the work 
we do is so important and there is so much of it. It made me think of the quote by Margaret Mead that many of us know, which is never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I, I think that security practitioners um, can create a more equitable and secure future for everybody because we're not doing this work for the work-life balance. We're not really doing this work for the money because there is far easier ways to make a living wage than security. And that level of commitment um, is what gives me hope for the future of security. And I think that being transparent with each other about what we experience as we progress in our careers into leadership roles is how we can discover kind of shared experience and that others are struggling with the same thing. And we can use that to create change. Um, my CISO, Sunil, <laughs> um, told me this morning that when I showed him a graphic, the kind of casserole discussing this graphic, um, <laughs> to make a quadrant, so I did. Um, I made a quadrant to organize kind of experiences that we have as security leaders. There are some that are wholesome. There are some that are intolerable and in inevitable. And I think those are areas that we need to revolve. And then there's some that, you know, are not that commonly shared experiences. Again, you know, there are things that are absolutely wholesome and things where we need to spark a revolution. So the first difficult lesson I learned in my first security leadership role is just how much relationships matter. Um, Gartner research on CSO effectiveness shows that the most effective CSOs spend a lot of time building relationships with other leaders. Um, and something I learned is the importance of partnerships with sales, with marketing, with business, because there is so much work and we cannot do it on our own. Um, something else, uh, and this was from a different study, is that the most effective CISOs avoid being in a defensive position over incidents, over risk. They don't apologize. And that kind of uh, not going on the defensive allows them to create better sense of partnership. Like it, it's, it's everybody's job to fix these risks. We need cross-functional collaboration. I think that is critically important. Um, Building social capital is another thing that I think is, is very important. Um, less difficult in the sense that, that most of us um, are pretty good at it already. You know, as a security person, you can't really force anybody to do anything. There are security teams that try to um, kind of be agents of punishment, but I don't think it's terribly effective for them. Um, so leading by influence is something that, that most of us are very good at already. And the last concept is something that, that really kind of surprised me is that when you need something, um, you know, my instinct is to march in there with a 45 page deck that I stayed up all night making that has all these radar charts showing like making a clear case for here's why I need these three hires. And that's not really how executives work. You know, you have to kind of seed an idea and you have to nurture it. You have to bring it up several times. Um, because, you know, I think that many of us get to a leadership role because we are so effective at being analytical and great at our jobs. And once we're there, we have to develop a new kind of soft skill set to negotiate what we need. The, the industry does need change. And this is not just security, it's the workforce. You know, um, there's a lot of studies that show how much um, individuals from underrepresented backgrounds, like myself, I'm a, I'm a woman, um, face bias, which is that, you know, people like to promote and resource uh, people who are, are like themselves. You know, I think that the odds are better of success if you go into an organization where there is a more diverse C-suite. Um, and as we create more diversity at the top, the process of building relationships between leadership becomes easier. Um, I talk to so many people on a daily basis who deal with imposter syndrome. Um, and I think that we need to call others out on it when we hear you know, women leaders or, or individuals who are a minority talking about how they don't feel qualified to be in a leadership position. We need to call each other out on this. Um, something that we can change is, is clear promotion pathways and OKRs for the teams that we're building to create a more level playing field and avoid promoting based on bias. 
and yeah, creating more diverse teams as well. So the first tip I have is that leaders spend Friday on gratitude and recognition. Recognize your teams, be grateful for your teams and recognize yourself, keep a, keep a wins sheet and share in your company Slack channels what you've done. You know, I did this speaking, I published this. Um, a lot of individuals from underrepresented backgrounds are pretty terrible at self-recognition, but it is critically important because if you cannot advocate for yourself, like who else, who else is going to? So be proud of your wins and, and share them. Second lesson I learned that was really difficult was about boundaries. And I think this is something that many of us struggle with because again, we are so committed to this work. We care about security and there is so much to secure. Um, in my, you know, first year in the leadership role, I really learned the hard way that you have to set time boundaries, working with global teams, working with teams outside your own time zone. You really need to be pretty aggressive about saying, you know, I take 8 PM meetings, two nights a week, not five nights a week. You have to set emotional boundaries. Um, there are things that you, you know, you need to fix, but you don't have permission to spend the money to fix it. And I think that you need to create a little bit of emotional space. Uh, because there are things that you cannot control. You need to set workload boundaries, which I'm going to speak to a little bit more later. And do not let yourself be in a position where your health is not attended to. You're not going to the doctor. You're not taking care of yourself um, because you're working so much. Uh, there was one study, I think it was published in Raconteur, that showed that security teams are typically expected to work 10 hours a week more than other teams, including other technical teams in the organization. And I think that we need to recognize that that's not acceptable, especially when it bleeds into our personal lives and our health. Um, and as we assume security leadership roles, I think that we need to draw attention to the fact that there is um, uneven standards for security team. Um, I think a lot of organizations in general struggle at recognizing rewarding technical teams, which can be security, it can be IT, it can be uh, product developers, engineers as well. Um, so I think that we need to take initiative and be really great at recognizing technical contribution um, in front of business leadership. And also, I think as we hire and kind of create teams, don't create a single point of failure where somebody has to pick up the phone in the middle of the night. Make sure that your on-call rotations are sufficiently staffed that people can get sick, they can take vacations, um, and they can have some work-life balance. This is um, a reference to a really great talk I heard earlier this summer from from Jackie Bo um, at Twitter, and she was talking about burnout and she said that in herself she recognizes that if she gets to the point where somebody comes to her with a, a, a great idea, and she doesn't have the kind of emotional bandwidth to say that's cool let's talk about this she's so overwhelmed that she she feels you know frustrated um, that's that's her sign of burnout and. Um, I feel like for me, it's the same, you know, if I'm not responding to my friends on text, if, if new ideas feel overwhelming to me, um, I need to create some boundaries. A difficult lesson number three, um, Emily Gladstone Cole spoke about this quite a bit. Uh, the relationship between security and sales. Um, it is definitely a frustrating one, but it's also a valuable one, depending on how you you see it and you structure it. It goes back to build creating um, business partnerships with other leaders. Um, customer trust is competitive currency in today's just kind of business climate in general. Um, so I think that if you kind of position yourself as an agent of, of customer trust, it it makes you a more valuable member of the organization from the business perspective. Something that surprised me is the amount of time I spent on those questionnaires that Emily referenced as well, and redlining contracts. Um, and that is something to be prepared for, for sure. I discovered in, in my past role that putting security into customer contracts was a win for, for me, because I was able to say, you know, passing these audits or doing these security things is, is an obligation to, you know, 45% of our customers. So creating that business partnership where I negotiated with the sales leadership, like, Put, put security into customer contracts as a value add was beneficial to my, to my team. Um, and the last thing I would point out is that no matter how you feel about it, executives are always gonna speak the language of revenue. I don't think that revenue is by any means the, the most 
um, a descriptive language for security impact, but it is a language that they speak, risk and revenue. Um, I think that perceptions of security as a cost center really need to evolve and, and partnering with sales is one way that you can change that within your organization. I think that privacy in general across the board in terms of privacy regulations, privacy legislation is an area that needs to evolve. Um, and that is an area that um, I think businesses are struggling to negotiate in their contracts. And last, I would say that um, manual approaches to reporting and risk modeling and threat modeling are no longer relevant. Great risk reports are like a can of cream and mushroom. They are fast, cost sensitive and condensed. <clears throat> Difficult lesson number three, don't be too perfect. And this goes back to what I, I talked about previously where a lot of people from underrepresented back backgrounds get into a leadership role and they have a tendency to just approach everything with just incredible perfection. Um, one of the hardest lessons I, I learned in, in a prior job was that you have to let stuff fall off your plate. If you're trying to get more hires and leadership isn't approving it, you, you can't keep pulling all-nighters to do the work for them. You should never be doing that. And it does not make a very convincing case for your hiring needs if you're doing the work of three people. Self-advocacy is not optional. You have to be very clear about here's where I want to be in my career to your manager. Um, you have to be very clear about your wins. Keep a detailed record of those wins because you are, again, your best advocate. And I think that, um, you know, the fact that 0.47, you know, um, percent of the, of the workforce is security is, is untenable. We need to change the biases uh, within our organizations and we need to completely change our mindset on talent pipeline and figure out better ways to engage entry-level professionals. There's a ton of mid-level and senior-level openings in security, and there's a ton of entry-level people who are trying to break in. I think that organizations, especially large ones, need to step up and figure out better vocational pathways, better apprenticeship pathways, and how we can better engage um, kind of entry-level talent to fix the security gap. Um, and I think that employers need to accept the fact that helping grow your, your security professionals, continuing learning for security professionals is mandatory and it should happen within work hours on work budget. If you hide your struggles, if you are silently doing three people's jobs or doing three people's jobs and not asking for the hires you need, you can't create a healthier situation for yourself. Set those boundaries. Let stuff fall off your plate. It's really hard, but it's really important. <laughs> learn to love frameworks such as SOC 2. What I learned about frameworks, frameworks are often where small businesses, startups, which is where I've spent my career, um, start investing in security. Customer asks you to pass an audit, you do it. But compliance doesn't really get you to a point where you're secure. And so then as a leader, you need to justify spending enough to get you to secure beyond kind of the compliance level. That is where I chose to use frameworks such as OWASP SAMS and the NIST um, CSF to justify the difference between compliance and mature um, and start doing benchmarking and creating kind of conversations where I was seeding ideas and nourishing them with leadership in my, in my prior organization around um, becoming more mature from a security standpoint. I don't think that in security leadership, you can escape frameworks, so might as well embrace them. And I think that as security professionals, we also have kind of a, a responsibility to contribute to frameworks such as OWASP, SAMS, and similar, um, to get frameworks to a place where they meet our needs and they reflect actual mature security best practice. There is definitely a gap between frameworks such as PCI, possibly, PCI DSS, and, and maybe maybe a HIPAA, a high-tech FedRAMP, I'm not sure, and, and what we should be doing, because actual development practice at, at cloud-native organizations, such as the ones I work at, is evolving so quickly. I apologize for the deck issues. 
Difficult lesson number five, and this speaks to um, the fact that sometimes you need to kind of cut bait. You can't really change an adult's mind. As a security leader, you are an internal evangelist for security in your organization. Um, and you are responsible to an extent for educating executives. Um, I have learned from mentors that spending a ton of time on budget, advocating for the budget you need, um, is inevitable for security leadership. You will live in PowerPoint, and a huge part of your job will be presenting information in ways that resonates with the executive team. That said, you cannot solely be responsible for fixing the risks in your, in your beautiful PowerPoints. And it's not really your job to convince anybody that security is a basic right, why you should be hitting the kind of bare minimum standards for your customers. That's not your job. And if you're in that position, I think it's important to honestly kind of evaluate whether or not you're in the right place. What needs to change? I think that as an industry, we need to look at why CISOs are lasting 11 months in positions um, and, and make it to where um, the industry is a little bit more tenable. CISOs cannot be scapegoats for risks. They need to be risk partners. I think that we need to shift organizational thinking to where security is responsible for risk to um, the fact that security is everybody's responsibility in business. And I think that the kind of office, the CISO structure, where there is there are multiple security leaders is going to become increasingly important. I have a disclaimer in the notes of this deck, which I will share um, to my boss. I'm not personally looking for a new job, but I think in general, just kind of blanket advice for everybody. As soon as you get a new job, start looking for your next one. You are your own best advocate and it's not your job to uh, change an adult's mind if you've hit the point where you cannot convince a company to invest any more in security. So I went through a job search in the last few months um, and landed at a, at a company that I'm very happy with. Um, however, I think it is incredibly important to be picky during a job search. This is a job seekers market. You have more choice than ever. <clears throat> Here are some actual <laughs> red flags that I encountered in my recent job search. Um, I received an email from a company um, asking to interview me that said that they had data on several million children, which were the customers, and they were just considering creating a security program with one person who'd also be responsible for the privacy of these children's data. It was terrifying. <laughs> um, it was another, um, and this wasn't a specific thing that somebody said. I think it's more a reflection of the fact that um, job descriptions and security can be absolutely ridiculous, um, where they want to pay almost nothing and, and get somebody with, you know, a CISP, a JD, and um, these incredible AppSec skills. Startups um, like to promise um, raises after a certain amount of time. I think that you should make the wage that you deserve to make from day one. And a final red flag, which is pretty common, is that security is not reporting into the C-suite. This is something you should run away with uh, or run away from, especially if you're looking at security leadership roles. You need to have a direct path um, to advocate for your needs. You do not want to be reporting into an IT manager. You don't want to be reporting into a VP of product because not only does this mean you have to go through several layers to, you know, get permission from the CFO to buy the tools that you need. It also means that um, there's typically a conflict of interest when it comes to compliance and privacy. When I started my job search, I had this attitude of, you know, I'll take any interview. It's good experience. And I don't think that advice stands in this market anymore. You are gonna get a lot of interviews if you're job searching, um, you know, perhaps especially if you have the years of experience to be a security leader, you're gonna get a lot of interest in your resume. And if a company is emailing you saying, let's set up an interview, we have data on several million children and no security, you do not need to say yes. You should run away. Before we kind of transition into the crock pot, part of this talk, um, I wanted to kind of offer a few reminders to everybody in the audience. Um, you are a security leader. Leadership is not the same as management. You do not need a manager title, director title, a VP title, CISO title to be a leader. I think that uh, people in security uh, often fight really, really, really hard to break in. 
They have incredible initiative outside of work to do continuing learning. And we're often people who are kind of unafraid of doing unpopular things. So I think that people in, in security are often fantastic leaders within organizations, whether or not they have a leader title. Um, another reminder, you deserve healthy, pay, uh, healthy boundary, boundaries, recognition, and fair pay. You do not have to put up with a job that does not allow you to create good work-life balance. Um, as somebody who speaks to a lot of underrepresented people in security, you're probably underrepresent or underestimating yourself. I hear so many signs of imposter syndrome on a daily basis. Um, be proud of, of who you are and what you've accomplished and be confident in the fact that all of us are contributing to a more secure and equitable future where security is recognized as a basic human right. I just spilled my coffee. <laughs> and uh, data breaches are inevitable or not inevitable. They're unlikely. So abrupt transition to crockpots. Hey, Bryson, any, any kind of questions or anything before I make the jump? Uh, there are some, but we're having an issue actually with your uh, sound being desynced. So we're, uh, we're trying to work on that. So I'm so sorry. Oh, no, it's not on. We don't think it's on your end. Okay. Crockpots are a severely underrated appliance. I live in a very small city apartment. I don't have a ton of kitchen appliances, but I do have a crock pot and I use it a lot. They are really pretty cheap. Um, I think especially compared to instant pots and, and things like that. Um, and they are great for small kitchens. The other thing I adore about crock pots is the fact that they are so forgiving. A lot of times, depending on what you're cooking, if you cook something for two extra hours, um, you're fine. And that is fantastic, especially given the, uh, the type of work that we do. Um, disclaimers before I start in on the kind of recipes and food. Um, this is not classy uh, cuisine. I'm not a chef. Um, the recipes I'm going to share do have animal products. I have made very detailed notes, the slides, which I will share in Slack, um, about how to modify pretty much every recipe for gluten-free, dairy-free, um, vegan, vegetarian. And also the recipes are in this deck because I ran out of time. I did not put them in GitHub, but I will share this resource with everybody. Um, Molly Ye is a, um, has a show on Food Network. And there was one time when she was discussing a, a casserole and made a joke about um, kind of like an X axis of how delicious the casserole is and why being how much it looked like throw up. I apologize if I've like offended or bothered anybody here, but I, I feel like this is relevant to the food that I make in my crock pot that's low effort. Um, a lot of it is extremely delicious and also has a huge resemblance to, to VOM. Here is one that is ultimately delicious and resembles VOM to a very great degree. A uh, wild rice hot dish, which I believe is the state dish of Minnesota, since wild rice is the state grain of Minnesota. Um, it involves cream of mushroom and uh, wild rice. And again, I'll share these recipes, uh, ground beef, which could, could easily be substituted for um, beyond beef and a few other ingredients. Another recipe I make pretty often is kind of a bean corn and chicken soup. Uh, there's a lot of cans that go into this, cans of beans, corn, olives, tomatoes. Um, but this is a recipe that you can definitely just kind of walk away from. You just dump it everything in at one time, um, which I will often do if I have 10 minutes between Zoom calls and forget about it for hours. I may have underestimated the, uh, the resemblance to VOM of this dish when I was placing it on the, the Yay model. Uh, cabbage soup um, is another one that I make a lot in winter. It's got beef and kind of veggies um, and some kidney beans as well. Tater tot hot dish um, is a very classic casserole, not often made in a crock pot, but I have mastered that. If my day is light and it has not completely gone off the rails yet, I will sometimes bake the tater tots a little bit before I put it on for kind of a crispier um, top of my dish. Um, not mandatory. You can just dump everything in the crock pot and walk away as well. 
and I have read on Reddit because I hang out on Reddit, Minnesota and Google casseroles sometimes, or, or look up casseroles that um, if you want to take a, a creme brulee uh, torch and, and brown the top of your tater tots, that that is one way you can kind of exceed, exceed the, uh, the mean on your tater tot hot dish. The last one, this is not something um, I am personally willing to eat. My partner is from the Midwest. He loves it. He loves it on football game days. Uh, Rotel Dip, three ingredients, Velveeta, highly polarizing processed cheese, um, ground beef, which could be substituted for Beyond Beef, um, and Rotel tomatoes. I will note this is the only recipe that I uh, do not have dairy-free vegan substitutes for because um, I think that it would require a fair amount of culinary skill in order to um, kind of use butternut squash or similar to, to make a fake Velveeta, but I'd be very interested in anybody who manages to do so. Kind of wrapping up, um, wanted to give credit to a few people. Um, I've had some wonderful mentors. Uh, Dee Young, who is CISO over at UNC Healthcare, has been a great mentor to me over the last few years. Same with Brian Thornton. Um, who is CEO of Net Reaction, a security firm, and one of my grad school professors. Um, my organization's designer, Chum, created this template that I proceeded to desecrate with my terrible graphic design skills. My partner, Cam, uh, is, is a very supportive human. He always eats my, um, my recipes, even when the kind of vom resemblance outweighs the deliciousness, and he got me breakfast this morning. And then I wanted to thank my, my new employer as well, who has been incredibly supportive um, and you know supported me being here. And really kind of quick, um, wanted to highlight a few ways that I would love to collaborate with everybody here over the next few months. I will share slides um, in Slack. You can also email slides at jupiter1.com for a copy as well if that is, is for whatever reason um, a better method. Uh, the, the report I'm working on, the, the SCAR report, the, uh, the State of Cyber Assets report, I am looking for practitioner reviewers for this report. Um, it is about 55 pages, including a lot of graphs. Um, and I am giving the opportunity for people to uh, kind of be listed as an editor on this report. And you can obviously kind of make that decision after you review it, uh, whether you want to be credited as an editor or not. So please reach out to me if, if you might be willing to kind of look at the research of, again, it's almost 400 million cyber assets. And I would really love it if people tweeted pictures of food or crockpots to me as well. I'm at Jasmine Henry 10 on Twitter. Bryce, and that was actually my last slide. I kind of felt the natural flow there. So uh, first question. Fantastic. Uh, the slide axes for your uh, measurement of meals. How did you come up with that? So again, it's a reference to a joke that the um, kind of Food Network star Molly Ye made in passing where she was she was referencing the kind of wild rice hot dish as well. Um, and she said, you know, if there was a Y axis for resemblance to vomit and how uh, X axis for how delicious it was, <laughs> this one would max it out. Um, and I, I really concur. Um, so my only contribution to this was visualizing it and abusing her framework. <laughs> I, I thought that was a really clever use. Um, uh, on the Slack channel, we had somebody who recommended that, uh, they are, uh, colloquially known as slop. Okay. I really enjoy learning new, um, kind of regional references to hot dishes and casseroles. So I appreciate that. Is there a link to the study that notes that security works 10 hours more per week than other teams? Yes, I can find that in, um, I'm not gonna look it up right now, but I will certainly link it alongside the slides uh, within about 10 minutes of finishing up here. Um, okay. Because I, I have referenced that myself and I think it's important for us to draw recognition to this. Uh, you mentioned on the slides that one of the challenges of course is unreasonable OKRs, uh, but isn't part of the challenge that OKRs are kind of like pushed down on us. And then at the same time Indeed. that managers themselves don't get the training to put in place good OKRs. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a difficult situation. So, um, 
you know, I think that <laughs> there's different things we can do. You know, if, if you're looking at for a job and, and somebody's looking for a CSO who's going to personally do like audits and pen testing and stuff, like just don't take those jobs. Like don't reward people who have unreasonable expectations. <laughs> um, and as well, I think that taking a really active role in building OKRs for yourself, for your, for your team, pushing back on OKRs that are passed down is really key um, because we have to educate our, you know, kind of business leadership about the realities of security work. They have no idea. I think, especially since the work that we do has evolved so quickly as we've moved to kind of cloud native infrastructures, like 10 years ago, there wasn't a guard duty that was generating 6,000 alerts a day. Um, and we need to be, um, I think, kind of at the helm of educating leaders about how much security has changed and what we need to do it successfully. Do you see a difference in the kinds of leadership challenges between a startup and a large enterprise? Yes, <laughs> I do. I However, do that all the time. I'm like, yes, that's you. There's your answer. I think that, um, there's no guarantee on either side of the fence that you are going to have executive support for security. Um, you know, obviously scale, um, scaled security team is going to affect what you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. But when I talk to, you know, security people at companies that are wildly different size than mine, I'm, I'm amazed at how much the same stuff we're dealing with. Like, oh, I'm, you know, creating this, you know, third PowerPoint presentation for like my hiring needs. I spend a lot of my time dealing with budget. Um, I think there's a lot that is shared in common experience, um, but life is much better when you're at an organization of any size and value security. All right, well, thank you very much for leading us both in the kitchen and the workplace here at PancakesCon. Thank you very much, Bryson.